Well, oh, another day, 14 days passed and we have another show. This time once more in our Kirby series. And uh, while the weather is still fine outside and it is sunny, I'm in the inside, but with me, we have got a few wonderful guests, which are Georg and Bastian. Hello, Hello. you two. Before we kick off, I'd like to say quickly thanks to uh, Zipgate, who support the whole series of Stay Curious this year, and um, who are, for those who already attended a Beyond Tellerant conference, uh, always great supporters and great friends. Uh, They, they really make it happen that um, I can do much more than I would be able to do without their financial support. But not only do they financially support the whole stuff, they also come up with great ideas, sit down with me and think about new formats, what they can do aside, like inside events and all this kind of stuff. So it's great to have uh, them on board always. Uh, same counts for our friends from Balsamic who are supporting this show as well. And then, thanks to Vito, which is not the name of the cat that Bastian is fighting with, but the name of the, 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 the platform we are using for tonight. Um, Vito is pretty young still, but as you can see, it is uh, already in um, pretty uh, good shape and you can do a lot of stuff. So I uh, created a sidebar on the left that uh, holds all the information you need for tonight. Um, Things like uh, information about uh, Georg, for example, uh, a few links where, where you can find uh, work from Georg um, and a bit of information about himself, as well as, uh, as the video archive. As for the Kirby series, we will always use the same hub, which is this one. So if you come back later, you will find a recording of today's uh, session, as well as the recording of our last session in December, which was the release from 3.5. Yes, uh, apart from that, uh, I'm only left with uh, telling you how the Q&A stuff works. So uh, Georg today is going to uh, break up his presentation into smaller blocks. After each of the blocks, we are um, um, making a short break to have the Q&A afterwards about the specific to topic he's covering. Um, you can, while he's presenting, ask your questions in the sidebar on the left uh, under questions, and we will pick them up and answer them as soon as possible. Um, Georg has given this talk in German and about a month ago, I think, or maybe six weeks, um, Bastian uh, uh, told me about the, the talk. I watched it and I said like, well, that would fit perfectly in, in, this, in this series. And Bastian agreed and we directly uh, yeah, made it happen. We had a, a free date today uh, uh, for the show. So, and I'm glad that uh, Georg said yes and is, uh, going to present this time in English so that maybe even a, a different group of, group of people who is not able to speak German is able to uh, uh, yeah, understand this great content that we will certainly see tonight. Bastian is a longtime friend of mine. We hang out at many events. If not a pandemic is happening, um, <laughs> I visited him. He visited me a couple of times already. We always end up uh, late in our kitchens <laughs> chatting about all things. It's always a wonderful uh, time when we hang out and uh, uh, share like what we do actually um, and uh, find out how many similarities our two different businesses have got. Um, but with this, I would say let's kick things off and get Georg on stage. Georg, are you ready? Yes. Yeah, cool. I think so. <laughs> Thank you, Great. Mark. Thank you, Bastian. Thanks for having me. The, the <laughs> um, stage is yours. Yeah, I want to... Thank you. <laughs> um, so I wanted to start with a quick intro about the concept, uh, giving you some overview about the overall architecture that we did. And yeah, before I getting into that, I'm Loba forced me to do a short advertising break. So just a few sentences about the company. Um, so Lova is obviously an outdoor company, outdoor footwear. They are one of the leading brands for this um, here in Germany, but in very many countries, uh, I have to say, for mountain and outdoor footwear. The headquarters is in Germany, um, so in the Munich area, in a very small village, actually. And the company is almost 100 years old now. And so there's quite some tradition and also a lot of innovation happening over all these years with a very strong focus on quality and fit of the shoes. 
And also good to know is that the production is completely happening in Europe. So only factories in Europe and everything is happening here. And that's it for the advertising. <laughs> uh, bottom line is they are good shoes. You can trust me on that. And that's it for the advertising today. And with that, I wanted to jump start into the website and what this is about. So the old website, um, we inherited the old website. It was built in typo three. It was not responsive. And yeah, I'm seeing, I think it was over 10 years old and it really went out of fashion over these years. And along with that, there was a strong growth of the company. Sales numbers really have grown. And along with the growth, there was a lot of professionalization happening, not just in the marketing organization, but in the entire company. And when we set out to create the new website, it was really our goal to establish a central tool um, for the next steps in the marketing, for the next steps in how we do storytelling, how we tell our product stories, our marketing stories, and also to help in the company growth as well. So um, before we started digging into the technical implementation, I think it's always important to set out some more strategic goals um, to get a better understanding about what we want to do and also to align our technical decisions with these strategic goals. So um, we decided on four primary goals. There are others as well, but four primary goals. And the first one is that we want to have a consistent communication and a streamlined international brand presence. So Lova has gone international over the last years very much. So they are now exporting in over 75 export markets. And of course, there are and not in every market, but in a lot of markets, there are local marketing organizations. And we wanted to have a more streamlined communication. We wanted to have um, something that the global marketing, the market headquarter marketing can ensure that communication is happening in a consistent way, in a, in a way that they approve. The second thing that we wanted to have is that we wanted to reduce the maintenance efforts. So the old website, as I said, built in Typo 3, um, did have a lot of bottlenecks in it. It was sometimes very expensive, very much work to maintain the content. It was very much siloed. I'm getting into that in a second. And we wanted to reduce the content maintenance efforts because we, um, with the growth in the organization, there are, of course, more marketing channels a lot more campaigns that are played in the different channels. And we didn't want to have the website be uh, adding so much on top to all the efforts we already do. So we wanted to uh, reduce those efforts. And we also wanted to reuse existing tools like Lova's ERP system or um, the, the product platforms or the media workflow, which we talk about later. We wanted to reuse as many existing tools as possible and leverage what is already in there. And we then wanted to have also a faster time to market for the digital communication. So um, I think it's very well known that digital is one of the fastest markets. And with Lova being more focused on the end consumer these days, um, it's very important that the marketing is sort of in a fast moving way. So we wanted to um, be the digital channel, the fastest of all the channels and ensure that we can do stuff and try stuff on the digital channels in a very fast and reliable way. And that's also very, a very important strategic goal that we had. And last but not least, we of course always want to ensure um, future applications. It's something you can put on every strategy slide, <laughs> but here it's especially true. We wanted to enable these future applications because as I said, um, the marketing wants to move fast. They want to try things. They want to be on the cutting edge of where the trend is going. And so they um, need to have a way to enable those future applications and to ensure that they can do stuff if they want to do it and not be blocked by any system or whatever. And we also wanted to integrate external partners in this whole ecosystem that I'm going to show, um, integrating countries, distributors, retailers, whatever. And we wanted to use all the synergies that we have and ensure an efficient growth in all of that, what we do. 
so if you look back on where we came from um, and speaking more about the IT perspective, so we came from a Typo3 website, as I already said, it was a very monolithic system. And I don't want to put any blame on anyone. It's back in the day when it was built, it was perfectly fine. But of course, you would approach this differently today. So um, it was a very monstrous, very monolithic system. These monolithic systems always pretend that they can do everything. But in fact, they make you very inflexible, very fixed, very static, static and rigid. And we always had the feeling that we are working against the system. So, and at the end of the day, these kind of systems are preventing innovation. And so the content is very much stuck in separate silos and we can't reuse it for anything else. We, for every new application that we create, we had to establish a separate content silo. And of course this prevents innovation in a way that's not sustainable, that's not working in the digital age. So the idea where we wanted to go with the new marketing platform um, is that we wanted to have a best of breed architecture. So we gave it a code name. It, we codenamed it the Lova Marketing Platform just to say, okay, that's what we want to have it <laughs> here. And so then we architected a best of breed approach, which means that we have very many lean and small systems and we don't have this monster system anymore that pretends it can do everything. But instead we have many lean, many small systems that are focused on one single task and that are doing this one single task very good, hopefully, and are very focused on this single task. And the systems communicate then via APIs, via interfaces with each other and interchange the data. But we didn't want to have a monster PIM system, a monster content management system, monster editorial system anymore. And of course, that's a huge disruption. It's a huge change, of course, from where we came from. It made us a lot more agile, more flexible, and we were no longer dependent on one single system here. So we could interchange systems as well if there is a need to. And this helps us now to act a lot faster, to try things, to break things if we want to. And we don't have to put a lot of effort in these things all the time. And we can just try them out and in increment over time. And of course, this strategy works a lot better in the in digitalization in these days, in my opinion, than like the monolithic approach than we had in the past. And a system like Kirby, if you use it headless, and I will explain this, it fits perfectly into this approach, in my opinion. And also some tools like Slack, like Cloudinary, or also these cloud infrastructures like Amazon S3 or Microsoft Azure, like we use, they all fit best into these uh, best of breed architectures. So as I said, and that's the reason why we are here, um, we're using Kirby um, as a content management system. And one thing that's very special to our setup is that we use two Kirby systems. So we have a backend Kirby system that works as a content store. Um, I always call it the API system, which is technically not correct, but it's easier for me to remember. Um, so it's the content storage system. It has all the marketing information in it. The PIM is in it. Uh, it's connected with Lova's ERP system, which creates article numbers and product base data. And we have also campaign story builders in it and a lot of approval processes and governance stuff. And then we have a second Kirby system um, that takes care of the front end based on rules and curation and uh, is actually delivering the website. I will talk about this architecture in a bit more detail in a second, but just that you have like an overall impression that we have two separate Kirby systems. And then we have like that's the idea of the best of breed architecture. We have other um, systems in this architecture as well, like for instance, a search service. So we use Algolia here, um, which is not just powering the site search, but also um, other searches on the website that we have. And we have a service for transactional emails as well. So to send one by one emails, uh, personalized emails, we currently use Spark Post for that. We also have a couple of tools and services actually to take care about image delivery, image storage, uh, video storage, video delivery. 
uh, which is a topic that we will talk about in more detail later as well. And something like a team chat, for instance, is also interesting to um, ensure that we have proper reporting and proper monitoring about all the processes that happening happen in the cloud. And of course, since this is a best of breed architecture, we are not uh, limited in stopping there. So there are a lot of perspectives and a lot of additional stuff we can add on top. And we are not just thinking about the web here, in fact. So currently, in fact, I worked on it today. <laughs> uh, we are working on print output for um, this thing. So um, we are thinking about um, having print material created out of this architecture. So right now I'm experimenting with print CSS. There might be other scenarios where we integrate InDesign even for some print products and output stuff in print material. And also we can do word transformations, for instance, that's something we already have done to transform the assets, to transform the content into word renditions, or we might end up building a asset portal um, which uh, retailers can use or distributors can use to download assets or to create other renditions of the content in the self-service backend portal. So there are a lot of possibilities that we can do in this architecture. And um, this is really the idea of it, that we are very easy and very flexible, can extend the architecture and add new applications along the way once we see fit and once we have the use case for that. So um, as I said, we have two Kirby's. <laughs> um, we have a front-end Kirby and we have a back-end Kirby. So why are we doing that? And I think that's very special. Uh, but in fact, I think it's a better approach for headless content management, at least I wouldn't say in every case, but at least in the use cases that we have here. And I started with very classic headless projects. I also come from print and have learned a couple of things um, there, how to decouple and uh, decouple content and representation. And I learned one or two things from that and um, the architecture that I did here is really much informed from these learnings. So we have a distinction here between a channel agnostic backend system and a channel specific frontend system. So on the one hand, we have content atoms that are media neutral, channel agnostic. And on the other hand, we have a page tree and the page tree is taking care of the website. So the idea is that the backend is just focusing on the content and on the workflows. And the content should be channel agnostic. It should be media neutral. It shouldn't be, there shouldn't be any specific content for the web in the backend system. And the frontend system, on the other hand, it takes care about the website. So if we need to do something like the curation of the homepage, which teaser goes where, for instance, or if we uh, need to uh, manage SEO texts, and you at some point you need to manage SEO texts, this has nothing, uh, no business in the backend system. It's very website specific. And that's the reason why everything like that happens in the front end CMS. And um, a static site generator, if we would have used that, um, wouldn't be able to handle that. So we would always have to put this content that is website specific in the headless backend content management system. And that always gets messy in my opinion, because we don't want to have this website specific data in a media neutral API driven backend system that should also um, work as the main or the single source of truth for other content channels as well. So the backend system is focusing on the media neutral content atoms and the frontend system is taking care about the page tree. And I always say that um, the one side is the creation of the content and the other side is the curation of the content. And I think that's a very important distinction because creation versus curation are two different things. And that's why we separate it into two different systems. And in the front end, a lot happens automatically. A lot happens also by algorithms. Um, but if we need to have a front-end specific configuration, like a design skin, for instance, we can just do that. And we can add this configuration to the front-end Kirby, to the front-end panel, and we don't have to pollute the back-end API system with this website-specific stuff. And that's, I think, a very important architecture decision that we made here. 
and it really helps us to keep everything clean and to make a, a proper separation of concern, concerns here between the different systems. Um, technically speaking, there is a lot of communication going on, obviously, between those two systems. Um, and we can go into detail if you're interested here, but we are like hooking the backend content to the front end. We're also doing some data transformation on the way to optimize the data structure for the front end or the overall for all the consumers of the backend. And then we store the front end again in uh, store the content again in the front end to ensure it, it's available when we render we want to render it, render it. And so that's basically the architecture on a very high level. We can go into more detail here if you're interested. And what's also important to say about the front end, first of all, the front end is the far more complex system. Um, the back end is basically just a regular Kirby without a front end. <laughs> so we have a panel, we have the fields in the panel. Of course, there are custom fields in it. Of course, there are a lot of workflows, uh, a lot of custom stuff that we implemented, but it's far more easier, I'd say, what we do in the back end. But the front end system does a lot of heavy lifting in terms of how it represents the content, how it merges content together. And also the front end system is uh, implemented using a country concept. So right now we have an IP detection. So when you go on the Lobo website, uh, your IP is detected and we redirect you to the most fitting country website. And then we have a country specific website for your country. So in Germany, we have different content than in Switzerland or in Finland or in uh, the Netherlands, whatever. So we have different country websites for the different markets. And right now we are powering, so between 50 and 60 different country websites. We even have product specific websites. So we have a website type for outdoor footwear and we have a website type for professional footwear inside the same country. So the front end is really a big machine <laughs> that is sort of compiling all the content together from all the different sources and doing a lot of algorithmic uh, calculations on top of that to deliver these all these different websites into the different markets and for the different output channels. So that's basically the architecture that we have here, those two different heads. And yeah, that's basically what I wanted to say in this first block here. Um, and so if there are any questions or if you want to know more, we can talk about that. That already is too much for me. <laughs> <laughs> Crazy. Yeah, that's really great. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm just blown away. I mean, this, I, I saw parts of this already. And um, to give you a bit more of a backstory before we continue, I mean, we, uh, Georg and I have been talking, I think, one and a half year ago when he talk, uh, told me that they are working on the Loba website. And we wanted to have you for the first Kirby conference last March, right? And yeah. you were supposed to give a talk there. And we would probably, some of us would already know about those things. But I think it's just so cool to see the setup. I mean, I've, I've never seen such a setup. You are the first one that I that yeah that comes across with such uh, a separation between the curation and the um, the content generation. And I think it's really brilliant. Um, of course, it's a big project. Uh, it's a big site with or multiple sites, as you just said. Um, but what what I would be interested in as a first question is how, like. How, how um, do you think, how applicable is it for, for other projects? Do you think a, a project has to have a certain size to uh, let, it, let such a two-headed um, setup make sense? Or do you think it can already start making sense at a smaller scale? Mm, um, yeah, I think it makes sense if you want to reuse the content for other channels. Um, mm -hmm. the, the thing that I said be between the communication of the two systems, so we figured that out at some point, but of course it's not something you don't write a hook and then it's in the front end and done. Yeah. Um, to, to really scale this and to really make this perf performant, um, it required some work and there's a lot mm -hmm. more to that than to make that actually work. Um, but I yeah. would say um, if 
you want to reuse the content and you want to have the content neutral, it's a good idea. Um, mm. Of course, it can add more complexity on top of everything. And But for me, many decisions where I put which content feel very natural um, mm. because the design skinning stuff is something I want to decide in the front end. Um, other things I want to decide in the back end. But sometimes the line gets a bit blurry, of course. Um, yeah. But I would say you need to have, it requires the, the um, IT infrastructure part of a project gets bigger when you do it like that. Hmm. And that's something I would take in mind if, if that's in the project. <laughs> uh, but I, I assume that it really pays off on the long term, right? It's, it's, it seems like hmm. a very good investment for the company to structure content like that, to make it that reusable i mean we often talk about reusable content and we often think about abstracting it from the design but as you said in reality it still often gets mixed together and you still often end up with content that is then quite connected with what is happening on the website and mm. I, i really think this is a super interesting approach in terms of the longevity of the content how how um yeah con sustainable can we make our content for anything that we mm. want to plan for the future. And did, did you um, feel like it was difficult to sell this um, concept to the client? Did they understand mm. it immediately? Or was it something you had to discuss with, with them? Um, yeah, of course, I don't always know how much is understood from what I say. <laughs> um, <Yeah. laughs> but um, so I'm not <laughs> always super sure about that. Um, but it wasn't super complicated. Basically, it were these four strategic goals that we set out at the beginning. And in fact, speaking of Lova, we presented it to the CEO of Lova and we said what we want to do and he was on board with that. And at the end of the day, it's like, okay, we want to reuse existing systems. We don't want to produce extra work. Um, we want to ensure you can do more stuff with less resources. So mm. we are talking about other things later. You can't say, okay, I'm scaling the marketing department to 30 people because you need to take care about every page yeah. of these pages. Um, that's just not viable in any way. And so these are, I think, very convincing points that you can make. Mm -hmm. And that I think also justifies the investment in IT because Loba could have also bought an, a PIM system by a PIM vendor for half a million dollars or whatever. <laughs> and uh, I think it's far more easier for them to do something like what we have done and interchange the system if there is any need to do that. Mm -hmm. um, but of course, it requires a more strategic approach to IT and digitalization. Yeah, that's We've got a couple of questions coming in. Yeah. Oh, um, in case you're done, Basti, don't know. Maybe, just, yeah, I just wanted to say that's the entire concept for the evening, right? So uh, Georg is giving us a bit of information about the project, then we interrupt him <laughs> blatantly <laughs> and then <laughs> we just talk yeah. about the question. And so this is how we imagined it. We just try to make it as fluent as possible. So I think it would be good to, to hear some of the questions and talk about them and then continue with the next block. Yeah. Okay. So Adam uh, has a question here. Um, Uh, he's asking, so the front end Kirby is a singular system building out multi multiple sites or is it a separate Kirby for each country or model site? And Felix adds uh, to it, wanted to ask the same uh, with the addition whether you simply use different configs in the first case. Mm -hmm. Yeah, basically that's what we do. Um, we have different config files, host-based configs, and then everything is like abstracted away. In the config, we have just something like uh, lower.country DE or something like that, or Lova website equals outdoor or something like that. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, everything else is like in the logic of the algorithms. So that's what I said. It's really a website machine. It's one Kirby installation. And then we have this uh, host-based config files. And then from that, everything else is controlled. Um, I will show one of the fields later. So the country uh, configuration for the marketing guys is very easy. Mm -hmm. They can just say in which market should which content go. And then in the front end, we decide what we want to show. The only drawback nice. about this is that we have to have something that we have in a host-based config. We can't say we have lova.com slash DE, but we need to have lova.de 
uh, or in case we don't have the top level domain, we are using subdomains like pl.lova.com. Mm. That's the only mm -hmm. drawback that we have. Um, but that's something that felt very natural at first um, because it's in Kirby, we can use that. Uh, what got a bit complicated was that we have different languages in all these countries. Um, so we sort of had to put a bit on top of Kirby to make that happen uh, because we so have five... Yeah, we have five basic languages, and in some la countries we show these languages and others these, and we have different default languages and different fallback languages. Okay, um, that means that you make translations in the content system, and then you pull them, the translations over as well to the front end. Yeah. Yeah, cool. Yeah. That's really yeah. nice. Okay. Um, we have another question from Dennis, uh, who's asking, how do you handle translations, uh, 50 to 60 websites, different output channels and parts of the website, content stored in backend Kirby and front end Kirby, or how are content editors able to stay on the top of that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, translations are always a big issue. And that's, I think that will never change. For Lova, they decided they have five languages um, that they are translating in. And for the backend, I think it's more easy. We have separate approval processes for every language. And um, so we have a marketing approval and every language is separately approved. And obviously we had only have these fields translatable that should be translated. So all the media fields and everything like that is not translatable. So we ha don't have to maintain it on and on again. Mm -hmm. um, and from the front end it's the same. But yeah, it requires some extra work and it requires editors to think about the languages. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. So Lobo has an, a, a translation agency and to be honest, we do a bit with DeepL as well. <laughs> and yeah, we have to take care about that. And it's always something you have to add on top. So we have different places where texts can happen uh, in the backend system, in the frontend panel or in the uh, T-strings in the language files as well. And we have to take care about them. But Lova made the commitment to support just these five languages, and that's it. Uh, so they don't do a po Polish website or whatever. Uh, mm -hmm. So if a country would want to do that, I think the country would have to pay for that and would need to take care yeah. about that at some point as well. Yeah. Very cool. Mark, do yes. you have another question? Or should we yes, move we, on with we... the next uh, we have two more questions. I think we, we uh, answer these two. Uh, and if there's more questions about this specific part, uh, we can answer them later in the in the end yeah. after um, after you're done, Georg. Mm -hmm. uh, so one from Carsten is, can you reiterate your point about not using uh, one of the real headless CMS systems for content creation, like Contentful or Graph CMS? They already mm -hmm. have a well-defined API. And by building different content models, you can still share content between websites and other channels. Uh, it seems mm -hmm. your solution is still strongly coupled between the two Kirby's. And then he um, adds, uh, adds by real, he, mean, he means uh, at least he thinks Kirby's approach as a CMS is not API first. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yeah, first of all, we pitched Contentful against Kirby for the Lova project. And Lova decided for Kirby mainly or not just, but price was an important reason here. That's to be very honest, uh, Kirby is just too cheap. And for Contentful, if you get into the higher tiers, it gets really expensive. Uh, so that's one strong argument that we was made here. And then I wouldn't really agree on that one. Of course, I see that there is a positioning happening with Contentful that is more like we are the headless CMS. But the thing that I like about Kirby the most is that it's, for me, it's more like a framework CMS. We can use it like that. And it doesn't feel unnatural to do it. And of, we had to build the API on our own, but we can build the API here like we want. And as I said, we want to integrate retailers. We want to integrate distributors. And for instance, we are giving them a product API that's very specific to the Lova use case. So the filtering by collections, filtering by target groups, whatever. And that's far, that's very good to implement in Kirby. So it wasn't really a stretch to do that with Kirby. And the other thing about the, how far they are coupled together, those two Kirby's, um, not that much. Of course, we could change the backend system 
and we could send a hook from Contentful to the front end Kirby. That would be possible. And if we would use a static site generator for the front end, it would also be possible. Of course, we established some processes um, that are specific to our use case and that make it smooth and um, not super redundant what we do. Um, but I wouldn't say it feels unnatural. Um, and this, yeah, that's the point I'd say. And of course, Kirby is so much, so easy to extend. Uh, it feels very good to do that. And we have done some other stuff with Kirby here as well, just to add a database editing view. It's super easy to do that. And Contentful would feel a bit more difficult. Also in terms of the approval processes, by the way. Um, in Kirby, we can implement the approval processes like we want. In Contentful, we most of the times would need a separate system that handles these governance processes at some point if they get more complex. Cool. At least that's my Thank opinion. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Thank yeah, you. Thank you very much. Um, we are already getting quite far into the details. I, um, I I love that. I mean, it's it's already giving us so much information. Uh, I just wonder if we should move on with the next block and then maybe have pick up a couple more questions uh, okay. later that go on in the, sure. in the technical details. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We can do this because uh, uh, Lucas and Martin have got questions, but that's then for afterwards. I mean, I, I know that the, the interesting part about the content is coming now, so maybe some questions already get answered. <laughs> ah, okay, cool. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay, then enter stage again, Georg. Okay, thank you. So uh, I wanted to move on and talking a bit more about the content modeling and the content architecture that we have in the LOVA system. And yeah, it's really one of my favorite topics because content modeling is fun <laughs> and you can do interesting stuff with it. And I wanted to start very basic and then we have a look at the Kirby backend as well. And then I wanted to highlight this on a more strategic level again to show what is possible just by doing this architecture. So uh, in this example, we are talking about LOVA athletes. Uh, LOVA athletes are basically like brand ambassadors. So very crazy people that go to the mountains for a living and do crazy expeditions. This one here is Ines Poppert. Uh, Stefan Klovac is also a very well-known alpinist, mountaineering person. Uh, they do really crazy shit. And so, of course, they should have a place on the website. And the content model for them looks a bit, first of all, pretty much standard. So, of course, every asset has a last name and a first name. Uh, we have a biography in a markdown field from it, a text field. We have a birthday profession. We even uh, query them for the size <laughs> um, because that's also interesting for athletes. And that would pretty much describe a neutral person content type. Um, but what I find interesting always is to make this transition from a neutral content type to a specific content type. So of course, with LOVA, we have a content strategy, we have marketing, branding strategy, we have things we want to communicate. And baking these things that we want to achieve in terms of the marketing into the content model at the end of the day ensures that we um, achieve our communication goals. And this is, for me, this is the translation of a, of a strategy into the IT. And this is what's, hap what's happening when we do content modeling. Um, so, and this is, sounds very sophisticated, but it, at the end for the athlete, it boils down to have a field for the home mountain and a field for the favorite climbing spot. And just that um, we can query these kind of things as well. We have an URL field, field here as well. But this is really the important thing to have this transition from the neutral person content type to the lower specific athlete content type. And every athlete is part of a team. So LOVA has uh, different teams uh, where they group together the athletes, the LOVA pro team, active team, climbing team. There are even country specific teams in Switzerland, for instance. And of course we have content models for these, for the team as well. And that's pretty much standard here. So description, logos, hero media, whatever. And that's the content we put in there. And we have another relation for athletes and they do activities. So 
every athlete is doing one or more activities. And in this case, we have a multi-selection field here, um, like ice climbing, like expeditions, hikes, whatever, strolls. We have different activities. And you will see in a minute that these activities are really much one of the center stones of our content ecosystem here. So the content model for activities, there is also a description. We have a structure field with testimonials where we again can add quotes, we can connect testimonials again, and we also have advantages here. And this is again an implementation of our content strategy. So for instance, we decided at some point that for everything that Lova is doing, we need to be able to tell about the distinctive advantages that Lova products are offering for that activity. So if you're doing ice climbing, for instance, there should be two, three Lova advantages that we want to communicate. And that's the reason why we baked them into the content model and why we made them required at that point and say, okay, they need to be there and we need to have them. And that, of course, is always challenging to the product team, but it's something that the marketing department and we decided upon that we need to have this as a baseline in our communication. So we have two relations, athletes do activities and athletes are part of a team. And with that, before we um, move on with the content model, I wanted to give you a quick view inside of the Kirby panel. So for those of us who know Kirby, um, this should look pretty familiar. Uh, we didn't do much custom styling, so it looks like the original Kirby brand here. You can see the biography field I mentioned, um, the URL field. You can see the different facts. Um, Eddie, I'm working a lot with tabs here because for some content models, we have a lot of different uh, data that we store, uh, different facts field. We have interviews, for instance, where we compile FAQs about the athlete here. We also compile quotes and they are all stored in structure fields with additional metadata and stuff like that. What's important to say about um, this uh, interface is that not everything that we see here is actually outputted on the website. And that's again one of the ideas that we have here. Um, because this is the API system, this is the backend system. It should be the central hub for all the content we have about Stefan Klovac in that example. And if anyone within the Lobo organization needs to look up something about this athlete, this should be the only place to go. <laughs> it doesn't matter if you need it for the website or anything like that. It could be outputted nowhere, but this should be the central hub of content and the single source of truth for all the content that we do. And so that's the reason why we have some fields here that we don't even output on the website, but we maintain them anyway to have them available in this content storage. Another few, because in the first slide, these were pretty much the standard Kirby fields. Um, here we can see a bit more uh, special stuff that we built in for Lova. So we have this connection fields um, where uh, the editors are able to connect other content types um, like they can connect the product or they connect the tour. And this is also a structure field with a custom implementation from us um, where they can select the product, get this nice preview, can select it, can filter with it, and then um, it's linked to this content type, to this element. Um, you can also see here that we have this activity selection where we also dynamically fetch all the other activities and show them and make them available for selection. And one important thing that you see here as well is basically what the editor in the backend system sees from the country concept. So we have this small toggle here. Yes, use this item worldwide. <laughs> and if this is toggled, then this means that this content goes on all the country websites. Done. And if we untoggle it, then it's a conditional field here. And then we get another selection uh, where the editor can select either a language and or a country. So they can say this content should go in all German speaking countries, then they select the E here. Or it should go in all English speaking countries, then they select EN. Um, or it should go just into the United States, then they can select EN US or DEDE or DEAT, for instance, if you want to have it in Austria or in just in Switzerland or whatever. And so this gives them some very granular, very fine grained control about where the content should go. Um, but also it's very easy to manage that and to control this here on a language and country uh, level. And that's 
part of the backend here, just to give you a bit of a perspective. It's it's Kirby. <laughs> and with that, um, I wanted to zoom a bit higher uh, um, because we have talked about the single content models now, but where this becomes really interesting is um, if you, when you think about the overall content system, the content ecosystem. And I will show you a subset of this. I've already talked about athletes. They are part of teams. They execute activities. And then there are other content models as well. For instance, expeditions. And athletes execute or are part of expeditions here in this case. So an expedition is another content model, um, which is basically in this case a story where we can tell the story about the expedition, but we can also add some additional metrics, some facts like the duration of the expedition, whatever. And for instance, we also have a geo track for the expedition. So if you ever want to walk through the North Pole, um, there might be a geo track for that on the Lobo website. Um, then we have other partner types here like blog partners. They are very similar to athletes, but not professional athletes. They do this, they usually don't do this for a living. In some cases they do, but usually not. Um, so there are very many similarities between athletes and blog partners, but also differences. So they have a different content model, therefore a different semantic way we can work with them. And blog partners also execute activities. They are part of expeditions. And for instance, they recommend tours. So we have another content model for tours um, where we also have metrics for the tour, like the difficulty, the duration, all these kinds of things, a, de uh, a description as well, and also a geo track. So we have geo tracks for tours as well. And the geo track for the tour is a required field, whereas for the expedition, you can have it or you don't have it. And we have other partner types, mountain schools as a last example, and they also recommend tours. They also have activities. And then we have connections from the expeditions to the activities uh, and from the tours to the activities. So expeditions are uh, marked as this is an expedition with ice climbing, or this is a tour with a multi-day hike or a single day hike or whatever. So activities, and you can already see it from this graph, um, are sort of a model where we group a lot of stuff together and um, connect a lot of different things with each other. And then we have products. And obviously, and this is just a subset of the content system, it's far bigger what we have, uh, but there's a whole other world of, about product-related content models waiting behind the corners of the slides. Um, but products also have activities, of course. So for every product, we have a definition from the product management, uh, which activities these products are suitable for. And they are also um, stored and connected. And this is like the content system that we have, this um, subset of it that I want to talk about. And the interesting thing is now that we can work with this content system and we query, we can query this content system stuff. For instance, and I start with a very basic example, we can of course say, show me all the expeditions of this team. And we can be very smart about that, but we can just build like an overview page for expeditions and we can have all the expeditions on it, or we can just have the expeditions of the team on it, or we can have the athlete page and connect all the expeditions the athlete was part of, or we can add a filter and say, Let's just give the expeditions to this country or with that activity or whatever. So this is just a really simple, basic example of what you can do. A more sophisticated thing is that we can say, show me all appropriate products for this tour. So, and because we have the connection from the um, tours to the activities and from the activities to the products, um, we can do this double jump in our content model and we can um, select appropriate products for the current tour at hand. And we can do this very smartly because we have product attributes and we can leverage these product attributes uh, in uh, which products we are actually showing. So for instance, we have a new product flag or we have highlight products that are ranked higher in the current collection. And of course, you would prefer those products to show on the tours website uh, for this tour. We can also couple male or female and male mo and kids models, sorry. 
so that we have like a tour for a, for a day hike. And then we show three different shoes for the whole family. And we group them automatically together based on the select selection algorithms. And the smart thing about this is that this is totally automatically done. There is no extra maintenance effort. If we have new models that are pulled online on the website, uh, we clear the cache obviously. And then in all the different country websites, we have the best possible product selection, the best possible product recommendation for this particular tour. And no one needs to take care about these connections. No one needs to edit that stuff um, because simply no one could handle that amount of content. You can create a marketing department as big as you want. If you have so many country websites and so much specific content um, and two, three times a year where new products are released, it's impossible to take care about this and to control all of that. And back to the earlier question, these are really convincing uh, points and arguments for the client. And this is actually how at least I try to sell such a solution and actually try to sell the content management system. And to be honest, the client needs to be interested in this kind of things because that's the machine the client gets. And the more the client understands about this machine, the more fun it is to work together and to explore all these opportunities that we have here. Uh, one more example I wanted to give is that you can, of course, do this the other way around. So if we say we have a product and we want to recommend tours for the product, we can, of course, also jump from the product to the activities to the tours. And that's also something that we wanted to have that was very deeply baked in into our content strategy. So we said we don't want to have just a regular product page like every other website has this regular shop template. I think it's always the same template that many websites have. So Loba decided very early and we were glad that they decided that they want to have something different and they want to integrate the storytelling and the relevance and the useful content as deeply as possible into the product world as, as, it, as possible. So um, we wanted to recommend tours on the product page because it delivers value. It's the storytelling we wanted to have. And here again, we can do algorithms. We can do very much scored selection stuff. So of course, if we say we are in the Swiss country website on a product page, we would prefer a tour that's from Switzerland. And we can do that because we, hold, we have all the data and we can uh, score a tour from Switzerland higher on the Swiss country website and show it on the product page a bit higher. And there is this is just a business logic. And basically, that's the IT implementation of the marketing strategy. And that's really fun, in my opinion, uh, because it's that transfer where these things really start to work and where you can feel that everything plays together. And again, this is no extra maintenance effort. So if we upload a new tour from Switzerland, it's automatically scored. For instance, we can also intersect the activities from the product. The product has three or four activities that it's suitable for, and the tours have activities. And then we can intersect these two activity groups and say we prefer the groups with the, the tours with the highest intersection um, from the current country. And this is just the business logic. And then the new tour gets automatically displayed on all the appropriate pages on all the appropriate places without anyone needing to take any extra care about this. And this is really what I like about content modeling because it opens up all these possibilities. And I'm pretty sure Bastian, Mark, you have other ideas what we can do with this as well. <laughs> yeah. Yes, I, I mean, guess the, we have. <laughs> the, yeah, I mean, the part before has already been so great, but this part is also, again, really, really awesome. Um, I mean, what I like so much about it is first the creativity, how much you use it creatively and you don't just model those um, models, you really use them, you make the best use of it. And what I think is interesting is that in my, uh, in my experience with my client projects, there often was the question, how can we keep our website relevant and um, 
with everything that you do or did, that you showed here, um, I think every part of content that goes into those uh, models and has been added to the system, um, that question automatically gets answered. The more content you have, the more um, interesting content you provide, the more interesting stories you can build and the more relevant the website stays. And it's not just a shop, it's not just a product, um, yeah, a pr showcase or whatever. And, and mm -hmm. what I really also liked about it is that products almost seem like an afterthought uh, in your content model. So the products were on the top left once you build all the other stuff around it. So the, uh, the athletes, the tours, the expeditions, everything seems like so much um, as a part of the core. It's not an afterthought to the products. It's quite the opposite way. And mm. I find it's quite unusual. It's, it's an unusual step for the clients. I think it's very brave from the clients to go that way, but it totally mm. makes sense in the end. So yeah, yeah, sure. I'm impressed. Yeah. That, yeah, that's what they want to do. Of course, the product is, Lova would say it the other way around. Everything's focused on the product. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but um, the marketing is always like, we need to have this useful content. And mm -hmm. we, uh, the product side is more like, okay, we don't want to tell anything about the product that's not true. And the product needs to work and it needs to be according to our standards. So, of course, the content model has a lot of different stuff for the product world as well especially for the technologies. Um, but you're right, um, the, this experience part of the website and the way we baked it together with the product part, that's really something I didn't really see in the market um, at mm. that point. And yeah. that's unique to Lova and we are very glad they did that, yeah. I mean, it builds. A, it probably builds a lot of trust. That's at least how I would see it. So you have mm. the athletes that use it, actually use the products. You have the tours that you can talk about. You have all this, this, this like real world experience that has been shown there about the products. And it's, I think it's a very, very clever way to to do it. Um, yeah. And I also, I think the model shows so clearly how it's reusable. Um, throughout different channels and not just build for the website, but you can do all those different cool things with it. It's, it's, it's brilliant. Yeah, and from Much. what I understood, uh, when, we, when we had uh, a, a small conversation beforehand, um, it's still just the beginning of it, right? You, you're still planning way more with the data you already have for like yeah. the ex external uh, um, um, things like printing and, and stuff, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah it's quite true. interesting. Um, yeah, because print really is still a huge part of the marketing mix for Lova and they do a lot of retailer marketing mm. um, which will which is still important and will probably get of course there's always change here but it's still very important to provide the retailers with a lot of material and of course not everything can be automated in that field there's a lot of individual design happening and campaigns mm. are built individually so we are not like making our graphic designers putting them out of work or stuff like that um no but um there is um, a huge potential in automating stuff like product data sheets or um, ads for instance with a retailer logo or stuff like that so we yeah. have a lot of plans here and also, it helps, uh, should help Lova in being more professional in, uh, on the next level because there are still Word uh, documents thrown, thrown around or a lot of extra work is still being done in product presentations and stuff like that. And the mm. more we get to the point where we just say, okay, this is the place where everything happens, um, the more viable all of that comes for Lova. And it's still stunning how much time you can save if you start automating single processes mm -hmm. and how much more resources did uh, happen uh, if you start automating these things. True. Uh, how hard yeah. did you find the, transa the, the, the transition from the old system? So how, how hard was it to fill in the content, the first iteration of the content? Did mm -hmm. what Was a lot of that content already available, but you just had to restructure it? Or did you have to start from scratch for many of those things? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, both things. Um, we didn't really, there wasn't really a huge part that we had to transfer from the old and the new system because the old website, it was really outdated and we knew for quite some time that it didn't hold up with all the content that we had. Mm -hmm. um, so the content was in all the places, but not in the old website. <laughs> and so that was one part. And the other part was that um, we really used this project as well to um, 
sort of strengthen the content strategy. So we develop the models together and the client needs to be interested in this stuff. But if they understand how relevant this is, then they are. And then there was a lot of content development work going into this project as well. And that's what actually did cost a lot of time because mm -hmm. this is always like work you need to, for the athletes, the athletes had to fill out a huge Excel table survey <laughs> um, with all the data that we needed, including the weight and the size and what, I don't know, the blood group or, <laughs> um, <laughs> so, um, and, and of course this, this takes time. But we said, yeah. okay, this is like the opportunity now to um, achieve a level of content on the level that we want to have it. Yeah. Did, nice. And how did the experience go with the marketing team? Like, how did they um, um, accept the system? How, how do they, how actively do they use it? And, and do they like using it? Or is it like, oh, shit, we have to fill in all this information. It's kind of, uh -huh. a, so, yeah. Um, yeah, for the initial project, we even implemented some import routes for them. So mm -hmm. give us the CSV file um, and then we imported it via batch um, for larger chunks of content. And yeah, but uh, and today I think we should ask the marketing department, but I would say they like working with the system. Mm. <laughs> um, of course, you always have power users and they really know their way around. And um, of course, there's always even if you have good validations, good required fields, there is always a lot of room for error because yeah. um, you can't validate everything. Um, so, but I would say we have these power users and I would say they appreciate it. it's an, a modern system. It looks good. It's fast. And um, it, it's pretty much self-explanatory for them because it works in the domain they are thinking. <laughs> mm. And That's also something I use many times as a key argument when selling stuff like that is that we want to build the system the way the company works and we, not the other way around. <laughs> and yeah. uh, that's a huge point when you speak about Kirby, for instance, or maybe even other systems that you can customize so heavily uh, in every aspect because it really works the way the company does. And then they feel yeah. at home. Yeah. That, that total ma totally matches my own experience with clients that most of the time are more comfortable when they have simple fields that they can fill in and they know what they have to fill in instead of making design decisions for the website. It's much yeah. easier for most of the time, it's much easier for them to just uh, keep doing their work, focus on their own work and be good at what they do and be good with the marketing um, part and not focus on design things when they change mm. uh, some text on the website. So Yeah, I think it fits quite well there. Yeah, it's super mm -hmm. interesting. Mark, what what do yeah. you think? Should we put put some questions in between? Or do yeah, we should, definitely, uh, should definitely. We... Yes, uh, Toby is waiting and is already excited to play some more tunes and yeah. to get us out and like stretch our legs and dance a bit to his music. But uh, there's a question from uh, Christian, um, and he's asking: Do you save the data in the backend uh, backend side via flat files? And if yes. Are you using some kind of uh, auto ID solution, and how uh, do you build up the relations between the content types? And mm -hmm. Bart is adding up a good question, and not only between the two systems, but also between the content models, e.g., athlete activity and stuff. And Adam then uh, adds the overall nitty-gritty details of template naming: uh, what's a model, what's a controller, what's a custom plugin, etc. Uh, The tiny details must be super interesting. So, how do you like? How do you uh -huh. come up with this, and how do you make it as or flexible enough that you can add stuff and not like run into like a, a one-way system where you go like, "Damn, we didn't think of that." No, uh, um, yeah, of course this happens also, <laughs> um, <laughs> but um, yeah, to, to, not sure if I remember everything. But yeah, we store it in content in flat files in the backend. Uh, We have some content types that we store in a database, for instance, retailers. And there are a lot of retailers, like, I don't know, three, five thousand, something like that. We don't store them in content files. We store them in the Postgres database and we use them as virtual pages inside of Query. Um, and then, yeah, absolutely, we have an auto ID system. Um, we developed something on our own. We are not using one of the available community plugins, but um, for us, every page in the backend, That's important to say every page in the backend has a content ID and that's unique. And that's the way we connect 
the content with each, with each other. And for the overall like implementation detail stuff, um, for us, everything is a plugin. Uh, there is nothing else in our system. Everything is a plugin. And we um, have, what, what we did is we have like plugin suites. We have a plugin for activities, for instance. And then you have the model in it, the blueprint in it, the templates, if, if you are speaking of the front end, custom routes, migrations, import, export routes, APIs, whatever. Everything that you need to have about activities is stored in the activity plugin. And that's one thing because it makes it very easy to find stuff and to ensure that everything is in the right place. Of course, there is always blurry lines and gray zones and decisions where you can put stuff, but basically it's like that. And what we do then as well is, um, that's something we do very heavily in the front end. We have a site method for every content type. So we have a site activities, um, which is a class activities where we register content the, just the pages mm -hmm. and then we can access this very easy so site activities find activity by id so we don't have to do all the abstraction all over again and we can also put some stuff like site products find for instance and then we can have a custom find function in our products class that um, we can query via article number or via content id or what we need in the current situation um, cool. yeah that's but that took some time to come up with this, but it scales very well. So I must say I'm right now a huge fan of having like a custom service class and this custom service class is registered as a site function. And then we can exit this, access this from everywhere and uh, do stuff with this. And usually behind this service class, there is a object oriented world of doing things. <laughs> uh, if we need any, like the shoe finder that we talk about after the break. This is the great thing about this project. We could dive in at pretty much any point and we could just talk <laughs> for hours and hours and it would still be super interesting. And But we would also get very deep, very quickly. But that's like what you get with maybe, such maybe, a big project, maybe it's right? also Yeah, maybe, and maybe it's also something for part two or whatever. I mean, yeah, okay, that's, exactly. that's the good thing here. Like, you know, very long yeah. discussion in in the in Discord or finally uh, the first Spavi conference where we can then talk about it like face-to-face -face and not just via yeah. digital medium. Exactly. Yes. And uh, we certainly get to more questions um, uh, after we are done with the presentation. But for now, I'd, I'd say like we get back to Toby. Uh, we make a short break of like 15 minutes. Um, Georg, ready? Yeah. Thanks, Mark. Cool. <laughs> uh, so let's jump right into it. Uh, yeah, the next thing I wanted to talk about are media workflows, uh, images and videos. And I must say, I'm not sure if Lova really agrees with me on this, but for me, this part is still technically the most exciting part of the website uh, because this is really where we put design and technology in a way together that still stuns me when I see it in action. Uh, but before we get into this, um, Again, from a more strategic level, why we do this, what I'm going to show you, is because we do it anyway. So it's no extra work for us. We are doing all the print material. There are a lot of shootings coming in on a regular basis. And we have to work with these shootings, with these photos, with these videos uh, anyway. And to do that in a way that makes sense on that scale means that we have to tag the shootings. We have to add some digital rights management. And we have to know where we can use a photo in which channels and which devices, which media, how long we can use it and stuff like that. So we have to do it anyway. We, and that's the reason why I wanted to integrate the media workflow pictures and videos as tightly as possible with our print processes. And here again, to achieve a single source of truth for um, the media assets as well. So this is very much aligned with our strategic priorities. And we were again aligned with reusing existing systems and no adding extra maintenance effort on top of that. So what we do here, um, we have um, a technology called XMP metadata, which is a very old technology. In fact, I looked it up recently. Um, when I started blogging over, I don't know, 18 years ago, one of my first blog articles was about XMP metadata. 
and they still exist. Adobe is not really putting that much development effort in it, but they are still there and you can still use them. And it's Adobe's metadata standard. And the cool thing is that um, this XMP metadata is directly stored in the files. So they are not in some database somewhere else, but the metadata is directly traveling with the files. And even in binary files, they are stored as XML structure and you can read them and use them. So what we did is we developed a custom XMP metadata data panel for a Photoshop and Adobe Bridge and which we have again a content model <laughs> and we have a content model here for shootings and for product images where we do the digital rights management like where we can use uh, the pictures in license start license end state and then we do a lot of things like tagging which shoe is on the picture so we have colleagues they know every shoe <laughs> and they tag each picture with the shoes that are shown on the picture and the actual model names and we also tag the activities on the uh, on the picture here. And this is very much, of course, connected with the entire content ecosystem. Not technically speaking, there is no real easy way to sync the metadata panel with the Kirby system. Maybe it would be possible, but didn't investigate that that much. Um, but we have the same set of activities here. We have the same set of target groups, seasons, all that kind of stuff. And we do the tagging in Photoshop and in the bridge and we save it on our file server like we use it for print production and what we do then sorry i'm here and what we do then is we have on our file server a very simple chrome job that monitors the changes to files it filters them by some metadata criteria and then we have a tool that maybe the web folks here not really know but since i'm originally a print person i know the tool um, it's called in focus switch which is still one of the hidden champions in the workflow tools i'd say it's a hot folder based automation tool and you can plug in tools like photoshop or command line tools or whatever into this hot folder based automation system so we monitor our file system we recognize changes we move them into these hot folders then we do some normalization via photoshop actions and then we just send a webhook to our api system to our backend kirby and upload the media files to the backend Kirby. Um, technically speaking, what we do is um, we have an API endpoint. This takes the pictures that we send via this webhook via Infocus switch. And then we extract the metadata, put it in a database, in a Postgres database in that case. And the actual files, the physical files, we put in an Azure blob storage. So the files and the metadata goes in going to separate directions. And then we have these uh, images and the videos stored in the cloud. And of course, we have for the API Kirby, we have a, an, a media API here as well that we can query and say, give me all the pictures with that shoe or with that person on it or whatever. Um, but ba that's basically like the workflow where we get from our print production into our assets cloud. And it's important to say, that for us, um, videos and pictures are totally interchangeable here. So, and this also goes for the website. So in every, every place on the website where we can have a picture, we can also have a video or a meme. And so that's a very interesting thing that we did here because this means that we can have a lot of video content on the website within the same workflows uh, that we have for images as well. So this um, image gets uploaded to the cloud. And before um, we will see what's possible there, I also wanted to give you the backend perspective here uh, briefly. Um, as I said, the files are stored on an Azure blob storage and the um, metadata is stored in the Postgres database. And what we do here, and this is again, one of the powers of Kirby, um, we integrate these files that are not in the classic Kirby way of doing things, but it was very easy to integrate them as virtual files in the Kirby system. So you can see them here. Um, they are regular files within Kirby, first class citizens here. Um, we can see all the metadata. They are not, metadata is here not editable because we wanted to have a single source of truth and that's our file storage, our file server in-house. Uh, but you can see all the metadata here. And then we developed some custom Kirby panel fields um, to make the easy select, 
uh, image selection, media selection a bit more easier. For instance, in the first screenshot, you can see the Stefan Glovac page again. And here we have a dedicated image selection field that only gives us the pictures or videos where Stefan is actually on. So this is also like safeguarding the editorial process to ensure that, of course, if we pick the profile picture for an athlete, we want to make sure that the athlete is actually on it. So we use that tagged information here. And then we have a more sophisticated selection field here again, um, where the editor can filter by shoe name, by activities, by collections, by people on the picture. And then we have this image selection field here to select one or multiple pictures, videos, and use them in the content. So this is the backend part, as I said, virtual files to integrate them very tightly into the Kirby system. And that's not very difficult to do, in fact. It's super simple. And what I find most amazing, and that's the reason why we do all this, is because we can now use this power of the metadata that we have stored in the files on the website. And we can do a lot of, I, I would still say, crazy shit here, <laughs> um, because we do automatic image selection based on this metadata. So I compiled four screenshots here from four different product pages, a female trekking shoe, a male um, all-terrain shoe, a male mountaineering boot, and a, I think, also male uh, more sporty outdoor shoe. And you can see that this is four times the same technology, Gore-Tex lining, which with, in this case, the same technology description, but you can see that there are four times different images. So for the female shoe, we have more female focused here. We, for the mountaineering shoe, there is a mountaineering scene. The sporty shoe is also differently shown. And so we have a pool of pictures here and we, um, we assign a score to those pictures or videos um, according to the metadata that we have. So the shoe has a set of activities. It has some target groups, kids, female, male, whatever. It has seasons like spring, summer, winter. And the same attributes are also in the media assets. And then we score each media asset against the attributes of the product page. And we have a scoring algorithm there. And then we score the images. And then we select them in the best possible way and show them here automatically um, together with matching technology. And this is super amazing what we do here because it opens up so many op possibilities, I'd say. So for instance, if you are again on the Swiss website, we can say we prefer a picture from Switzerland over an image from Germany. <laughs> so um, we would show the Swiss Alps here uh, instead of some German, whatever, Saxony Alps or what we have here. And we would prefer this image. So we can again very tightly integrate our continent communication plan with the data that we actually have. And again, this is something that goes without maintenance. So we have like, I'd say 500 different products, something like that. And if you multiply that with 60 different country websites, it would be impossible to um, achieve a distinctive image selection for if each and every one of them. And because, but we wanted to have this very long product page that really opens up the world for every product and gives a feeling for every product and what you can do with it and communicate via these very emotional images in some way. So it would be even be impossible to do this just for the set of 500 standard products. Multiplied by country, it's impossible. No one can do that. But with that workflow, we can do uh, we can do it. And it's, again, something that's constantly updating and refreshing. So if we get a new shooting, um, my colleagues are tagging the shooting. They save it on our file server. The cron job monitors this, uploads it to the cloud. Um, then we clear the cache, populate it to the front end. And then all the scores change accordingly. And the new shooting gets immediately used in all the right places where it needs to be shown. And no one needs to think about this. And no one could think about this, in fact. And th again, the single source of truth for this is our print media production storage. And we do the same for product images as well. So um, there's a lot of image retouching going into these um, because some of them are shooting with prototypes. So sometimes we need to do a lot of work there. 
And if my colleagues are changing the color or removing a hook or whatever, they just save the file on our file system and they don't need to take care about that it gets automatically changed in all the needed places in our digital communication. And that's a super important thing because otherwise it would always add so much extra complexity on what we do, no one could handle that. And one important thing I wanted to show on these screenshots as well is that we not just do this for the images, and um, you can see that there are testimonials on these pages as well uh, that give a quote about Goretex aligning. And we compiled different quotes, different testimonials um, from different types of people. And you can see that we have a dynamic testimonial selection here as well. So on the female product page, the first screenshot, we have a female testimonial that tells something about why Goretex lining is great. And on the mountaineering page, you have a pro team athlete again, that tells the testimonial. And on the other two screenshots, you have Michael, which is, who is Lova's head of marketing, sort of as a fallback if you don't have a more specific testimonial on these pages. So again, we do the selection here based on how all these things fit together. And then we have some scores on it. And then we pick the most suitable um, testimonials or pictures here as well. And you can see also in the screenshots that we have design skins, so different backgrounds, different typography, and like different campaigns that we play here. And we also incorporated this. Yeah, so much for the media stuff. One thing to say is that we do the image delivery with Cloudinary, which is also, I think, a great piece of technology. So we use their power to make uh, good crops, image focused and stuff like that. Um, out of it. So that's also an important part that ensures we have a good quality here. Yeah, and that's it, what I wanted to say about media workflow. Back to you for the question. Yeah. yeah, back to a couple of questions before we have some smaller bits and pieces coming together that are, already, uh, that, that, that are also quite uh, interesting um, if I look at the summary here. Um, but well, yeah, uh, images and like media stuff that, that is still something I cannot imagine, like how big something like this can grow in, uh, in, in the, in the future. Right. So you never know, will, will Kirby really hold if, if this is growing to a, like a monstrous, like CMS database, not database actually driven, uh, thing. So mm -hmm. this is like something that, uh, uh, I cannot imagine, uh, really. And, uh. As Bastian put it in a um, in the talk already, uh, like the attention to detail uh, in the technical implementation is like just gorgeous, really uh, crazy. Absolutely. Let me look for a few questions. Uh, so Martin has a question. If Bastian, you you are like no questions from your end so far? No, because I, I feel like I'm blocking so many good questions from the uh, <laughs> Let's find out. And that's kind of a shame. Yeah, we have got Martin here. Uh, and he's asking, uh, regarding the pictures, could you briefly describe the log logic of uh, Michael, uh, no, logic, if Michael were to leave the company? Um, yeah, Michael Flunk, Lova's head of marketing. Hopefully, we will not leave the company anytime soon. <laughs> uh, but yeah, um, there are a couple of things we could do. Um, of course, we could just say, okay, we uh, removed this. Um, we removed the employee in this case. So there is, of course, a content model for um, the athlete, for employees, and so on. And if we could just remove the approval from them, this would automatically invalidate all his testimonials, and then it would just be removed from the scoring, and we would pick the next scored testimonial. So that's one possibility. Um, okay. In that case, we could also say. Um, Michael is replaced by another head of marketing. So we just um, change the content and everything stays intact. So there are a lot of possibilities, but in fact is, um, or we, we even have this right now because we could say um, that one of the testimonials we have here is not in every country visible. So let's say this athlete here, Robert Jasper, he is just a German athlete. It's not the case, but it could be then we wouldn't pick this testimonial in Switzerland. So that's the power of all these algorithms because we only use what's available and then we apply the scores. Nice, really nice. Um, 
And Felix is asking, uh, how often would you clear the cache and re-evaluate the images? <laughs> yeah, uh, caching is a different beast to discuss. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, very briefly speaking, um, for these images, it's I oversold it a bit. We are not doing this like every minute for all the images, refreshing them all the time because that's too complex. But we have an we have several overnight processes, and via them we um, group the images overnight again with the products, and then it's in the front end again. Um, but if we remove an image, it gets done immediately, for instance. Um, but for that, and also for a lot of other like data structure cleaning stuff, I saw another question earlier that goes and go in, went in that direction. Um, if we have changes in the data structure, like changes in the content model, we have overnight processes that clean that up. So we always have like uh, incremental processes during the day that take care of the day-to-day -day of the individual changes, but if we have um, data structure or content model changes, we do this overnight. And the same goes for the images in this case. But um, for instance, if we change a product image, this gets directly pushed into the front end. It's a matter of five, image, five minutes, something like that. And we invalidate the entire cache every time we get a content update in the front end. Mm -hmm. And then we do it again. But yeah, we can, if there is more interest in, ca interest in caching, we can discuss this uh, later as well. Caching is a big topic cool. for the website. <laughs> yeah, I'd expect this. Um, yeah, Eric has a nice question here as well. Uh, he, he was asking, um, how do you handle the changes of content structure? For example, uh, when new, uh, new needs require it. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, that's like the same thing. If you have a backend change, like a new field in the blueprint, um, then we have for every content model, we have an export function that takes care about data transformations, what we do. And then this is changed there accordingly. And after that, it, it's changed. And for that, we have these overnight processes that take care about cleaning up all the content overnight. So if we have a change and we want to do some adoptions here and there, um, then we have these overnight processes. For instance, it's the same for our product import process. So we import product from Lova's ERP system, and we have during the day incremental processes that take care about changes, for instance, a changed price or a different weight calculation or whatever, or a changed article number. This gets done during the day every two, four hours. But if we have a change in the data structure, we have an overnight process that cleans everything up and normalizes everything again. And that's basically how we architected these things, like having always an incremental process and a normalizing process that go mm -hmm. hand in hand. Okay. And uh, what kind of content was the hardest to implement, Eric asked? Hmm. Is there anything um, like this, I've... the hardest <laughs> to implement? Um, yeah, we can talk about stories. Stories are very complicated because they are narratives, they work differently than like the athletes we've show, we shown. Um, mm -hmm. Besides that, I would say the first one was the most difficult. <laughs> and after that, you have a lot of patterns. And right now, doing a new blueprint, adding a new content type is really easy, usually, because uh, we have so many patterns in place. We don't reinvent the wheel all the time. So that's what I would say. But maybe the stories are really complicated, yeah. Yeah, I think that fits quite well to Eric's uh, third question. How much time did it take to model the data on paper versus actually implementing it in Kirby? So he said it's it's what it was harder in the beginning, and now it's getting it's getting faster because you you already have a yeah. lot of stuff that you can read. Cool. Yeah, but can you give an a, can you give a rough estimate? Is it is it even possible to say like we we sit down for a, for a it takes about half a day to implement the blueprint properly or it takes it a couple hours or what what would mm. you say i would say it's more in the hour region maybe we, we invoice more <laughs> um but um it's more in the hour region. <laughs> this is private channel here <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, yeah but it's actually of course worth more than the time you actually sometimes spend. Yeah, yeah. Um, because yeah. The, what I would say the most complicated part is that I open up one of my notebooks and uh, sort of draft what mm -hmm. I want to do. 
And this is where the actual work goes in. Um, yeah. Building the blueprint is with what we have right now. I just need to know where do I have what or do I have a library where I can compile stuff together. Uh, but that's super easy. That's more a matter of hours at most for a simpler content model. And um, for instance, we had this podcast thing. Um, it was that the backend part is so simple. It's done in a couple of hours. Then you, you have the blueprint, you have the backend, uh, the export model. It's just merely a, a copy paste exercise at that point uh, mm. because everything's in place. If you would do something new, of course, it would be a different thing. But right now, Very nice. we have all the connection yeah. fields, everything. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. We have a couple of things lined up still. Should we continue, Georg? Ready? Yeah, I think, yeah. We, we still have a few questions, but we get to them later. And um, mm -hmm. a few are already still uh, f for the first couple of blocks. But mm -hmm. you're ready, Georg? Should sure. we move on? Um, cool. Then the next thing I wanted to talk about is the shoe finder. And yeah, the shoe finder was a very important part of the Lova website concept. Um, because Lova has a lot of products and sometimes it's not so easy to pick the right one. And yeah, you need to be sure to pick the right shoe if you go in the mountains and want to do something, uh, should be the right shoe for the current situation. Uh, so we wanted to develop a shoe finder application. And for that, we did a lot of research. We went to retailers, did some mystery shopping, talked with Lova sales. And what we found out was that there is a common principle behind that I at some point called it the shoe table principle. And this basically means that if you go into a retail store in a brick and mortar store, you have, uh, everyone has, there's a table of shoes <laughs> and they want to sell you at least one of these shoes. And what uh, the salesperson is doing is they are like asking one question after another to remove shoes over shoes from the table to arrive at, let's say two or three shoes that you can try and test. And that's the basic principle of the sales process. And what we did then is we um, transferred this shoe table principle into software. So this is, again, we have a pool of products and this uh, products, they have attributes from the PIM system. So like the target group activities, stiffness, for instance, lining material or colors. And each and every one of these product attributes has a weight. So we determined how important this product attribute is for the overall product selection process. So of course, the most important thing uh, to know is the target group. So we didn't want to sell a kid shoe to a woman or whatever. And so this is, for instance, a very important product attribute. And that's in that case, always the first question that we ask. And after that, we have already a narrowed field And then we have a statistical spreading algorithm, which sounds a bit more fancy than it actually is, but we have an algorithm that sort of assesses the pool of products that we have currently and determines which question, which product attribute we query for next to narrow the field in the most possible way, in the best possible way. So we've tried to find out which question is the best question to remove as many products as possible from the current product pool. And then after that question, we do again this spreading algorithm thing and determine the next question and do this process over and over again until we arrive at a small enough set of products, three to four products that we then can present to the user and uh, say, okay, these are like the recommendations we can give you. And Of course, there are softer and harder product attributes. Um, for instance, the target group is a really hard product attribute. We remove all the products that are not in the current target group, group from the pool. Uh, on the other hand, we have colors and colors are a softer attribute. So of course, it's nice to have a shoe in a color you like, but we said for an outdoor shoe, it's more important that the shoe does the right thing and is capable of what you want to do. And in that case, you might want to accept a slightly different color than you originally wanted to have. So this is a more softer attribute. And with that, we um, go through these questions and arrive at a pool of products. And the smart thing well, when we do it like that is that we always get a result. <laughs> and that's, in fact, 
the, the thing that a retailer would also want to have. A retailer would also always wants to sell at least one product. So he will always ask the questions, always present you the products that are um, that he has on stock and that he has available. And that's basically the same that we do here. There is no combination of questions that we ask throughout the process, whereas uh, there could be no result. There is always a result. There is always a product recommendation because we also ask always the questions that are fitting to the current pool of products that we have available. And one thing that I wanted to highlight for the shoe finder is um, a particularly cool feature, I'd say. Um, we were implementing something and I sort of had an epiphany at some point and I asked myself, wouldn't it be good if we could, if the user could just enter the place the user wants to go and we show the user uh, which shoe is the most suitable for this place. <laughs> and first of all, that's not possible. And what, what is important to understand here is that actually the place where we want to go is very important for the product selection because every place on earth has a climate, has a climate condition and the lining of the shoe, the lining material um, plays an important role on how suitable the shoe is for, the product, for this climate. So for instance, Gore-Tex shoes, they are more suitable for wet and cold situations, uh, whereas leather lining is better for dry and warm climates. So it's not always that Gore-Tex is better. Some people are always buying Gore-Tex, but sometimes leather lining is the better choice. So um, it's important to know which climate zone is happening. And so this was the idea, that was, this was the goal. And what we did in the implementation is I found a data set from a research group in Vienna and they um, created a data set with all the land mass coordinates on Earth with latitude and longitude. And they mapped all these coordinates to the so-called Köppen climate classification, which is a scientific um, classification system for climate zones. So every climate zone has a number A, B, E and sub numbers A, F, A, A, D, whatever. And so every, they mapped every land mass coordinate to these climate zones. So I used this data set. Um, they made this available publicly. And I added an API on top of the data set via Kirby routes um, that I could query with every lat and longitude. Uh, and it would give me back the uh, climate zone for that place. And based on that, we used Google map search API. So giving the user an input field where they could uh, enter a place, then we get the latitude longitude from Google for that place. Then we query the API with the um, data set, with the research data set. And then we have the climate zone for the place the user entered. And with that, we uh, added in the PIM system, in the Kirby backend system, for every lining material in the technology content model, we added a climate usability structure field where the LOBA product uh, marketing, uh, product management team, sorry, could uh, connect these climate zones and add a score to them to say, okay, um, Gore-Tex lining is suitable for polar climate 20%. And it's suitable for temperate climate 100%. So the lower product management can decide how suitable uh, the, the, the lining is for the climate zones. And with that, we were able to really go this full circle. So the user enters the climate zone and we can then recommend uh, the shoes with the lining that fits best to the climate that's happening in that place. And this is really, really great, I'd say. And it also, it, it works very good because for instance, if uh, the user enters the Zugspitze, Germany's highest mountain, um, then this data set says, okay, we have a polar climate there. And if on the other hand, the user enters uh, Garmisch-Partenkirchen, which is down the Zugspitze in the, in the valley, um, then you have a temperate climate there and a different climate zone. And so you might get a different product recommendation in that case. And the user can add as many places as, as, as they like and we compile um, all these uh, climate zones together and then we make an intersection and uh, see what's the best fit. So this is really like an, I would say an amazing uh, interplay of different technologies and it really solves a problem for the user here and it works very well. And one more thing for the shoe finder, 
is the architecture. Um, this is again something I would say, does it have to do something with Kirby? I'm not 100% sure, but Kirby helps us doing that by being such a framework based system. So we can do all this object oriented development stuff that goes into this application um, without working against the system and without having it feel in any way unnatural. So what we did here is we have, again, a decoupled architecture. So we have a backend shoe finder system, um, which is basically happening, happening in the Kirby backend system, uh, which is a shoe finder API. And this backend part does all the filtering, the calculation, the business logic, uh, all that kind of stuff. And the website is a client to that front end. And it does the design, it does the user interface, the website output, it takes the content from the website in some ways, and it communicates with the backend. There's a back and forth between of two of them, where the backend calculates the next question to show, and the front end then takes the user input, reports it back, and then comes the next question, and so on and so forth. So this is um, what we have right now. And with that architecture, we already laid the groundwork to use to reuse the shoe finder application again for different applications. So if we ever want to do an Amazon Alexa voice skin or a Facebook chatbot, I don't know if there's still a thing. I don't think so. Um, but if you ever want to do something like that, or if you ever want to integrate it in any other third party or in any other channel, then we have like a separation of the business logic. And then we can develop another client for that, that leverages this business logic and does the product selection, the product uh, scoring and all that stuff in a consistent way across all shoe finder tools that Lova might offer at some point. And yeah, that's what I wanted to talk about for the shoe finder. The thing with this presentation is it's, a, it's such a luxury problem that we still have so many more slides and I don't know how long we want to stay up tonight. But it's so cool. I mean, the first part was great. Then the second part was great. And every time something comes along, we think like, oh man, this is so creative. I, this is just, it's so much more than just building a website. It's so much more than just so, doing something for the so, client. So it's, it's so many layers to it. It's incredible. Here's, here's one suggestion. Why shouldn't we get to the questions now and then pick the uh, stuff that um, Georg um, prepared as a backup kind of uh, and do yeah. a part two, maybe do a part yeah. two uh, um, after a short break. And then uh, we, we uh, Georg is able to structure that backup parts, maybe work on that. Maybe it evolves in the time until we meet again. And then we find a date and do a part two about this then. Could be nice, right? I'm open yeah. for everything. We can do that. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Yeah. Sounds. Because otherwise, <laughs> otherwise we might really uh, uh, run short, like for answering the questions that are still there. It's not not too many, yeah. but maybe that it, uh, sparks a few conversations um, as well. So, so let's too. let's dive into the questions, right? Mm -hmm. So let me get the questions. Um. Adam is asking one, uh, and he was asking, quite a bit of the content lives in a database and is brought in as a virtual page. When I experimented uh, with virtual pages, um, I felt a bit of a pain around the panel listing larger uh, amount, like 500 and more, of virtual pages. How did Georg and his team deal with this? Some super interesting code, some virtual page listener, uh, just live with it marketing. So. That's the question. <laughs> um, yeah, no super interesting code. Um, I would say we try to limit the number of sub pages. That's always a good idea to do that, um, to sort of integrate layers in between. For instance, we have country containers that structure the content before that. But we have one of these cases for retailers, for instance. We have just a Germany container. And then in the Germany container, we have like 3,000 retailers. And they are stored in a database. Um, but yeah. actually, it's not that slow. Um, we use this uh, page table plugin for that. I don't know if that's the correct name, mm -hmm. but it's this plugin where you can have a table and you can filter and search in it. And it makes it very accessible. It takes like one or two seconds to load this amount of pages in the panel. And then that's it. And in the front end, I must say it's no problem at all. Um, 
we don't see any difficulties with that amount of pages, I'd say. And speaking mm -hmm. of virtual pages generally, I'm a huge fan of them. I use them all the time um, to merge and aggregate all sorts of content. I think it's one of the biggest points where I, I was lucky that we went to Kirby Tree, uh, even if it was still in beta at that point, because it made so many things easier. And I don't see that many issues with them also in terms of performance. But as I said, if you have so many sub pages in the panel, we use this page table plugin, but yeah, that's not the performance issues that I see at this point. Cool. Interesting. Yeah. Um, Felix has a small question. He says about uh, the overnight processes. Uh, how can this work on a page which is available in many different time zones? Because it's like yeah. no one overnight. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, that's absolutely right. Um, to be honest, Lobo is still a very much Europe-focused company. <laughs> um, so, uh, of course, they do stuff in overseas and in Asia as well. But the main business is happening in Europe by a far amount. Um, but that's correct. And that's something we are working on um, because we are sort of refactoring our architecture um, into Kubernetes clusters and uh, decoupling the these backend processes from the actual delivery processes. Um, but it's also no problem right now because we are not like mm -hmm. erasing the website <laughs> and building it from scratch and it takes three hours or stuff like that. And the content gets updated on a constantly basis. Once it's updated, we clear the cache and then it's done. So it's, it's, work, it's working fine. And we arrived at the point where all of this is very efficient and we do only updates when needed. So there are a lot of nights where nothing is really happening. And this works okay. very well, I'd say. Yeah. But it's correct. There is always a, on the earth, there is always a time where there is no night. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, here's another question concerning images. Um, uh, Bart is asking, am I correct? You tag the content IDs in the XMP, uh, XMP metadata, uh, for example, for collections inside Bridge and Photoshop. Is, is there a more readable way of ed um, for editors to manage this? Um, yeah, the editors, um, you saw this correctly. We do this because we don't want to connect titles. That's uh, That could be a huge issue if you do that. Mm -hmm. um, but um, yeah, the XMP metadata panel that Photoshop and Bridge offer, they are good, but you, they are, as I said, they are not really like, they don't put a lot of development effort in it. So what works, works, and what doesn't work, doesn't work. Um, but um, for the editor, they see the thing, uh, the title that they select, but uh, in the preview, they don't just see the content ID. But if they click into this, they can see the title. So they know what mm -hmm. they do. They don't need to have a spreadsheet with, uh, with a table besides them when they tag the stuff. Um, but it could be better, but there is not much we can do about that. But it's, mm -hmm. um, they know what they do when they tag and they don't need to remember the content IDs. So it's an acceptable trade-off for the, the massive yeah. gain that you have out of the system. Uh, yeah. Cool. Yeah. Um, Mark, should we go back to the two questions that we missed in the first yes. block? Yes. I'm, I'm about. Um, I just had a look at the the other uh, things because um, there's there's one that actually also interests me a lot, and uh, that was asked by Bart as well. And he he was asking, can you elaborate a bit more about the approval process? We were talking about this earlier. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yeah. Approval process. Basically, what the editor sees in the panel is just like a field and it says approved, yes or no. And this is done by user rights management to enable this field or not. And what we do then on top of that is we have a couple of hooks that do update, create and stuff like that. They're registered on these events. And then we, for instance, send emails out and say, okay, this is a new content item that an editor wants to approve. And then we send an email to all the approvers in the system for that workflow. And they get an email, they can log in the system, and then they can say yes or no. And with this yes or no decision, another email gets sent out and it says to the actual editor, it's approved or it's not approved, um, stuff like that. So uh, basically mm -hmm. we, we register events on these checkboxes with the actions that happen. And that's something you can do in the most convenient way as you want. And that's also something I like uh, on Kirby here. 
because you, you have just this hook architecture, then you register events on the fields and then you can send out emails or Slack notifications or whatever you want to have mm -hmm. um, about this event. And of course, um, this yes or no state is then coupled with the publishing of the content. So mm -hmm. if something is not published, uh, not approved, sorry, it gets not published. And for Lova, we have a beta environment, a preview environment, and a production environment. And unapproved content goes into the beta environment so that the editor can preview the content. And approved content goes only in the production environment and, and in the beta environment as well. And so that's basically the process. And yeah, it's not super complicated to implement with hooks and custom emails, uh, a bit of rights management in the panel. And the rest is pretty much as you want to design. We did some very complex approval processes, not just for the Rover project, but I did for another project as well with legal texts. And you can have multiple approval stages that happen sequentially or parallel. And for Lova, we have a marketing approval process and a product approval process. And for the product approval process, the product management needs to give the approval and the marketing department needs to give the approval. And if only if both of them are given, the content is displayed. And yeah, that's what I really like here because it's um, not super complicated to implement. It's mainly, again, just hooks and workflows that you build on top of that. And also something like, one more thing, if an editor edits an already existing content that is already approved, we reset the approval and trigger the approval process again. So because we don't want to have any back doors here. <laughs> um, otherwise, editors would wait for the approval, then get it approved, and then they change what they want. <laughs> and yeah, yeah. Then it's on the website. <laughs> um, so yeah. if someone who is not in the right group does something, it, the approval gets removed, and then we start the process again. Yeah, but it's interesting that you customize this so much to your needs, and it's probably something that in such a big con um, in such a big setup and in such a big team, um, you will always have like a very specific requirement for how it should yeah. go, or like the different positions that need to be uh, included in the process. And so it's interesting that you customize it so much. Yeah. True. Yeah. Ma so what, what um, were the two the two old questions, Mark? The two, old, uh, the two older questions, uh, one was about um, images from Martin, uh, and he was asking, how do you handle images? Um, does the content, uh, do the content creators know where the images will be displayed later um, regarding size and ratio and so on? And Adam added, uh, plus the print experiments and CMYK RGB color space as well. Mm -hmm. yeah, so I think most do... of the, the first part is already answered from your big this, yes, asset but the block. second part this is was, this was before the, the you spoke mm -hmm. about the, the asset management but I think yeah. the, the sizes and the ratio is still a super interesting question like did uh, mm -hmm. did you ever come to a point where, where something went totally wrong where um, you feel like yeah. oh shit this is this looks like yeah this this mm -hmm. doesn't look right yeah yeah, yeah. no um, this happens and it still happens um, it's always a matter how extreme the formats are. You. And mm -hmm. what we have as a particular problem with Lova is that, of course, the shoes are important <laughs> and the shoes are mm -hmm. on the bottom of the person, <laughs> um, but the yeah. face is also important and it's on top of the person. <laughs> so if you have a very <laughs> extreme cut, <laughs> it could be possible that the face recognition of Cloudinary is sort of focusing on the page, <laughs> on the face, but the actual shoe is not on it. And that's not mm. always, Lobo isn't super like pissy on this one, but of course you want to show the shoes. Um, but what we can do here, and this is something Cloudinary offers, we can for every image define a region of interest. And mm. uh, this is something we can do in the Cloudinary backend, uh, design a, decide on a bounding box, and then this gets honored in some way. It's not guaranteed that it's working in every way. And what I like to do a lot is um, I like to use um, square formats or landscape formats on the desktop and portraits on the mobile. Um, so with a picture tag and stuff like that, um, because the, uh, these portrait images that are as high as the iPhone or whatever, they look really great on mobile. And so we flip the orientation between in the responsive way. Mm -hmm. And then we, of course, it's important that the cuts make sense. We do cover a lot of that with the points of interest, but there could be cases where the image is just not working. There are extreme images um, that in some cases are not working for every format, yeah. 
Um, but that's also something we learned throughout the pro process or the project, um, how, what robust formats work and how we do that in a way that usually works very well. Mm. And Adam's question about the CMYK RGB color space thing, do you have already some experience with uh, like print output and um, conver conversions in this case? Do you store stuff as RGB or as CMYK or do you convert it and do you have like mm -hmm. proper processes there? Mm -hmm. um, so in our print media storage, we store in RGB. Um, so the times where you convert to CMYK for print production are over. Usually you don't do that anymore. So it's stored mm -hmm. in RGB, but we do some conversion in the upload. I think we convert it to sRGB when we upload it. Mm -hmm. And um, the way back that you were asking for, if you do print production again, that's something I'm currently investigating. <laughs> um, but I'm not really sure if we need to do high-end print production from a print mm -hmm. CSS. Um, and also this would work in my opinion because RGB to CMYK conversion is also, it's working. But we can, yeah. probably I would do it more further downstream the process, not in the actual HTML to PDF conversion, but maybe more <laughs> in a tool like, like Switch again. Yeah. I think um, talking about print products, you were talking mostly about stuff like um, price tags or like flyers and, and mm, simple yeah. print products that would go with pro um, projects and uh, with products and that would need to be printed in a, in a very complicated way because you have so many products and then you have to build all those yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, design yeah. documents for them or, or you have to feed it through some X XML. So that's the... Yeah kind of print products we're talking about, not like full catalogs probably, right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, we are still starting on this one, but uh, it's mm. the same with every automation. You need to have enough volume to justify the automation. Yeah. And so we are mainly talking, as you said, about products that are needed for every product, like a data sheet or a price list. And Mm. I hope that we arrive at a point that's currently what it looks like with the Sprint CSS technology. If this is very accessible for us to work with that, then maybe it makes fun and we do more with that. <laughs> um, yeah. But if, if it's uh, complicated, I experimented with InDesign a bit and super complicated to create this InDesign file format and then it's no fun and then you won't do it or, you know, on scale. Mm. Um, but if you find Sounds a way good. to make it work... <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a good plan. Yeah. yeah. Do yeah, we have, do we have one more left? Yeah, yeah. yeah absolutely. Uh, there's the one from Lukas Bestle, um, yeah, yeah. Um, which was uh, asked pretty early. So finally, we're getting to it. An interesting one also. Um, how does the content get from the API side to the front end side? Uh, is it copied uh, or merged on a content uh, on content changes, or is it like dynamically requested? Mm -hmm. Um, no, we don't dynamically request this because this would add another bottleneck to the front-end delivery. So we store it again in the front-end, which might sound a bit duplicate. Um, <clears throat> we could argue about that if it's the best way, but we store it again in the front-end with some transformed data structure, not the same way as it's stored in the uh, back-end, but with some justifications, some optimizations that we do here. And the great thing is with, with Kirby again, is that we have like this backend content. And if we do some content that's added on top in the front end panel, then it's stored alongside the backend content. And if mm -hmm. something updates from the backend, it gets it's merged on a constant basis. The front end content stays intact and the backend content ah, updates. Nice. Mm -hmm. And that way we can, for that's instance, really cool. add a, a design skin in the front end and the product, the rest of the product data comes from the backend. And that so we have Basically, all the, the the front end would be workable without the back end. That's an important yeah. thing here. If the API system is down, the front end would still work because it's independently working from the back end. Oh, that's very nice. Cool, cool concept. Yeah, um, Flo Florian uh, Schinkel uh, asks, and that's in uh, the content model is really great. But if you you if the marketing team wants to change a specific date, uh, data on a website, for example, promote a new tour, is there a clear way to do that? And is it like self-explaining, or are those workflows something the marketing needs to learn in, in like uh, like workshops or like day, daily uh, mm -hmm. workshops from from a specialist? And it's like super complicated. 
Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, for this, wherever we do automated selections, it's of course something that needs to be understood un- up to some point because they need to understand mm-hmm. what factors play into the algorithm. And of course, there's a lot of opportunity there in terms of data. And mostly when something goes wrong there, you can always point to some data failure here, like wrong activities or wrongly matched uh, target groups or whatever. And on the other hand, we almost always have the possibility to curate on top of that automatic selection. Mm -hmm. Um, So if we want to promote a tour on the homepage or or on the other, um, just to say that the homepage is totally curated. The homepage is not done automatically. This is just like a teaser construct in the front end. And there is also a lot going into that for the country concept, but it's, there is no automation there for the homepage, for instance. And for the tour, if you recommend a product, um, we can use the algorithm. But if they want to promote for some reason some product and say, okay, I'm smarter than the system, we need to have this product here, then they can always do that. Um, but it's important for them, and this is, of course, still an ongoing discussion. It's not that it's every day happy <laughs> uh, what mm-hmm. we do here. Um, of course, they need to understand what's going on there because they need to understand the consequences that this have. If they hardwire a product at some place, they have at some point they won't understand that they have every tour with a hardwired product and that half mm-hmm. of these products are no longer on sale so that they lost all the recommendations, for instance. So we give them the opportunity to curate on top of the automatic selections, but we don't encourage that. And I think it's always better to fine tune the selection algorithms if there are any issues that we say this is not ideal or to improve the data quality. That's also something with the image selections. Of course, you can find product pages on the website that are not ideal in every image selection we have. And that's mainly because of the underlying data, wrongly tagged images, um, wrongly matched product yeah. activity, stuff like that. But that, that's the nice part about it, right? So the website kind of becomes a quality assurance tool in, in yeah. some way. So when you find something, you can say, okay, we have to fix that, but that's at the same time paying off because it's improving our content in the end and it's making our source yeah. of truth better for whatever we build out of it afterwards. Yeah. And that's, uh, that. Well, it's, I, I guess it's probably easy to sell that way and not something where you say, oh shit, we have to fix it again. Yeah. yeah. And we're also thinking about adding some brief light to the website. Mm-hmm. So some health monitors here to say, okay, is the content intact? Are there any issues with the content? And then mm-hmm. again, it's just um, it's an, just an idea. If you can say we have a score for each image, we could define a threshold for the score and say, okay, if mm. the score is below some point for the image selections, then we report this as an error, and then we can autom- then marketing can uh, look into nice. these errors and uh, react on them, for instance. So that's something yeah. we are considering for later this year at some point um, to say, okay, how can we ensure? that the website is always intact and we are not so much required that uh, some stuff is con- monitored by mm. something. Yeah. What, what I like so much about this concept in general is also that you kind of give so much, um, how would I say, justification for the work you're doing. Like with every little aspect that you add to the system, the system becomes so much better and the client mm. gets kind of more uh, attached to you, not in a bad way, Uh, not like they are becoming dependent of you, but in a more productive way. So you're you're creating a better productive team together. And that's, Mm -hmm. I think that's, that's really cool. So the the agency role is a completely different role than just being the the agency that builds a website. it's, It's much more involved in the entire process of content curation of um, the image curation of it, it, this entire thing. So it's just a, such a holistic approach to everything. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. yeah. So and now comes the interesting question, uh, by HYR, um, what made you think to use Kirby as the solution for such a complex website? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, good yeah that's a good question. Um, hmm. Well, to be said, it's just like some way of trust in the technology that's built over year, over years. Um, 
Lova wasn't the first Kobe, Kirby project we did. <laughs> and we did a slightly smaller, but also very big Kirby project before that in a similar architecture. And before that, we did a lot of smaller or mid-sized Kirby projects. And at some point, we just arrived in a trust in the technology. Um, of course, I must say, in hindsight, Kirby 2 was a different thing that Kirby 3 is right now. I think we can all agree on that. Um, but Kirby 2 was also pretty powerful. And we did the predecessor, the other project we did before Lova is still on Kirby 2. And we did a lot of, we did also this duplicate headless architecture with that. Um, so there is still a, just a lot of trust in the technology. Um, but I would say, of course, um, Contentful came up earlier. Contentful for me merely is the price tag and also this very jam stack uh, world they are like promoting where I think maybe it's not always the ideal way to do it like that, uh, to have the static site generators. Um, but this modern content management systems, Kirby is one of them. I think you can work with them in this way. And this is the fun that the systems have. And hmm. this, um, as I said, the shoe finder at the end of the day, it doesn't have too much to do with Kirby, but the content management part of it uh, is we can something we can use and we can work with. And also we are heavily using stuff like collections or whatever, um, or structure objects and all of that stuff. And so it, it, wasn't just, it wasn't really a decision at that point because we had a lot of trust in the technology already from the projects we did before. And we grow, have grown over time. I'm not, I do take risks, but I'm not taking a risk like doing such a big project with a technology I've never used before. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's nice to, nice to hear. And must be nice to hear for you, uh, Bastian, as well, in, in terms of like what, what Kirby is capable of, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we, we always build it in that way. Like the idea to have a system that's, as you said, more like a, f a CMS framework, uh, um, a system that helps you build all kinds of ideas. And this project is just such a perfect example for what we would like to enable people to do with it. I mean, we, we couldn't even imagine something like that in, in that extent. But of course, this is like a, a dream project for us to show, okay, yeah, it, it, the idea works. The idea to be this kind of Lego brick, brick uh, tool set. Um, yeah, it's, it's mm -hmm. really cool to see that it works like that. Oh, yeah. And uh, Lucas actually picked up a, qu a question out of the uh, stream of the main chat by uh, Jim... Jim Bob James, uh, sorry if I like <laughs> totally fucked it up, but uh, um, and he's asking. Uh, I'm really interested about the content tree. I've built sites with uh, tens of thousands of files in the content tree, and Kirby doesn't even blink. I'm guessing this site is much bigger. How did you deal with that? Uh, was the sheer amount of content an issue, and how uh, was it solved? If so, mm -hmm. mm, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's of course it's an issue, but it's not that it's like the biggest page on on earth. It's more like the scaling thing that we have with the country websites. That's an issue in terms of how you cache stuff and how you deal with all that. Um, but Lobo has just to give an estimate, they have 500 products, and so we have 500 pages here. And then we have a collection concept that groups together these products for like the collections they market. So this adds over time and we have a lot of sub pages. So every technology for every product is a sub page, but it's a very distributed tree by that. So that's mm -hmm. not the real issue here. Um, it's more like um, really the amount of pages that we drive by that. And that's what we try to abstract away with the cache. And what's also sort of an issue is that the live rendering of the website is not super fast. Um, but that's not because of the amount of pages, but because of the country concept that we have, um, because the menu is totally dynamic. So every mm -hmm. menu item gets controlled by what content is visible in the current country. And we control that from the bottom up. So if an athlete is listed, the container gets listed and therefore the menu item gets listed. But if there are no listed elements, then the container is not listed and the menu item is not listed. So we, we do, um, we always overwrite the is listed function in the models here. 
and uh, do some custom logic on top of that. And that's the reason why with the menu, when we render the menu, we have to basically evaluate almost all sub pages um, to understand mm -hmm. what the menu looks like. And that's the main issue in terms of performance when we do live rendering. And that's why yeah. we in, have really invested a lot in caching architecture to ensure that the menu doesn't need, there is no need to live render that menu all the time because that's the main bottleneck we have. But that's kind of the, the downside probably of such a um, dynamic system, right? Where you mm -hmm. everything gets pulled in and scored and combined and... Yeah. Um, I mean, this is this is something that we struggle with all the time. I mean, the caching concept for CMS is always like uh, such a big, complicated thing because yeah. cache invalidation is 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 based on so many different um, um, yeah factors throughout a site and completely different factors uh, on different mm -hmm. projects. Yeah. So yeah, I totally get that. That's that's one of the the major pain points in such a big pro uh, project. I think yeah. uh, Nico uh, also from the team just asked uh, a good uncomfortable question for us, which fits nicely. So which pain points of Kirby does this project really bring to light? So now I wish that Nico was in this uh, thing and could talk to you about it, and not I have to sit here and talk <laughs> to to you about it. <laughs> Um, no, no, none that I've prepared right now. And I don't want to do the marketing thing over and over again, but the thing about Curve is that we can read the source code and we can actually understand it. And mm -hmm. that makes it very easy for us to work with it. I think we have done a lot of things in how we work with the Kirby objects. Um, so sometimes there are, of course, things that get a bit messy or whatever, but we can always yeah. work and deal with the situations. The main thing that really struggled me throughout the project is the thing I mentioned right now, that's the cache. Mm. Um, but it's not something I would blame on the system um, because Kirby does a good job with the standard page cache and what we do is very, very specific. And as you said, we invalidate the entire cache all the time because it's. I tried it for three or four days to build a content tree where I can recognize which content is used where but it wasn't mm. possible <laughs> um, yeah. so, uh, to invalidate on a more uh, granular basis here. But that wasn't possible. But yeah, that's something we came up with. And besides that, I have no pain points prepared for you um, that I would say are like something that annoys me all the time <laughs> or something like that. It's, it's fun to work with. And as I said, we don't really have, feel like we are working against the system. And that's for me the main thing, as long as I or we know what we do in terms of development, we don't really think that we work against the system in any way. Mm -hmm. It's super important for me to know or to say that we didn't set this up, right? So when we discussed how we going, we go to talk about this, I just said it would be nice if you show more Kirby screen uh, shots than you did in the last presentation that we saw. Mm -hmm. but. This was intended as a Kirby uh, um, TV commercial kind of thing. Um, so for me, the system that you build around the the, the Lova um, site is just the the main actor in this case. And then of course, it's great to hear that Kirby works well for you. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's it's just so cool to see what you built out of it. Um, so I just wanted to emphasis on that that it's not. It's not set up that Georg is saying such nice things. <laughs> um, I would, I would completely uh, jump into here then uh, as well. Like going like, no, well, so this, marketing, is not... this is not how this no, no, no. take curious not, event I, show I, is I, working. I, I wouldn't do that. <laughs> I wouldn't yeah. do that. No, this was this was important. It's not meant. Yeah. So well. and that, then we have a question by uh, HYR, which is like turning the thing around that we just had. Um, uh, who's asking uh, after seeing this approach? like and such a, a a website using kirby what ideas does this give to you to build stuff into kirby maybe in the future is there like something where you where you, if you see a project like this where you go like well wow never thought of this and like and then you you make notes and think of things maybe just not new things but also like doing things differently mm -hmm. yeah ex of course i mean this is a gold mine basically for ideas um the I think the XMP, 
it's, it's XMP, right? Yeah. Uh, so yeah. the standard is super interesting. I would really want to look into that. I mean, it would be so cool to be able to store metadata directly in um, in the files and not have some additional meta files as text files. I don't know uh, how easy that would be, how complicated mm -hmm. it would be to write a parser and a, and a writer for that. But I mean, that just el eliminating those extra text files would be super cool. I don't know, just as extra option, not as something that would probably replace it all the time, but I could totally see that. And then the caching thing is something that when, when I see the, um, the problems in such a big project, you instantly think, okay, how could we do this? How could we solve this, make it easier for every project, not just for such big, big projects, but in, um, as you, we spoke about it before in preparation that you um, build your own snippet cache so you can um, cache snippets individually and not just entire pages. I think this is something that we really should do uh, in the core and just provide a snippet cache out of the box. Uh, there, there are many new things or additional things. We, we've been planning on improving the headless part um, anyway. So this is something that's that's fitting here as well. Um, yeah, it's just giving so many ideas. And nobody replies. <laughs> <laughs> Are you still there? Hello? <laughs> Mark is gone. Are you muted? Mark is muted. <laughs> yes, I am. And it sounds like you, you muted yourself as well because you were like totally cut off at one at some point when you stop well wow yeah i was i was looking if there are any more questions but uh, it seems we got through all of them so yeah, far i think we wrapped them up yes and that's that's also quite nice because um we are already a bit over time and we don't want to keep you any longer because uh yes. i think like two hours is a nice a nice time uh frame to to do stuff like this anything else and we are now already a little, a little uh, longer than two hours. Um, it's a bit exhausting and focus on that. But as we said already, let's do a, a, a sequel to this and a number two. I, I would be totally up for it if you are interested. And mostly if uh, the people out there sitting in front of the screens and reading and listening to us uh, um, are interested. Maybe we have a, uh, um, a short question about this in, uh, in Discord, in your Discord, Basti. Yeah. And, but I, uh, but I'm this, most uh, certain, yeah. But I'm most certain uh, that people will like to listen more to more yeah. uh, of, of this. I mean, it's 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 so cool to see that so many questions came along and mm -hmm. so many mm -hmm. great questions, and uh, we we didn't really know what to expect. Um, we we thought about this block concept and to break it down into various little blocks that we can talk about afterwards. But that so many questions came up. Um, this was really cool. But of course, yes. yeah, I agree. We need a sequel because of that. So if Georg is up for it, then sure, I would be up. Sure, we can do that. <laughs> Yay, nice. Yeah. That is nice. And uh, yeah, and also, uh, as I mentioned before, um, everybody can uh, come back to this hub uh, if they don't want to or don't uh, uh, like to um, uh, use YouTube where the videos will be up. Um, but this video mm -hmm. also will be stored here, like the other one as well. You can come back. You can have a scroll through the uh, conversation as well. It won't be deleted um, if you like. Uh, and this most probably is going to be the place where we're going to meet for the next uh, episode as well. Mm -hmm. um, so we keep this up and just add the content we make in the Kirby series, as I called it, um, and add it piece by piece. And uh, next to this, you will, of course, find it uh, on the Kirby cast. YouTube channel uh, as well as mm -hmm. on Beyond Tolerance YouTube channel. Yeah. Well, thank you two so much. Uh, that was thank lovely. You, Mark. It's, yeah, uh, thank you so much for hosting this. I mean, it's so cool that yes. we can use the hub that you provide this for free for us, and uh, it's just so nice. Great. And also, I see I see him preparing in the back, but let, let's get him on stage. Thank you, Toby, for playing thank here as well. <laughs> Thank you. That's so nice of you. So, yeah, but before I give you a little more of Toby's music talent, uh, I'd like to uh, quickly say thank you, Georg, so, so much for preparing this in English, as uh, all, uh, all the stuff, for preparing the slides and working on the structure and stuff. That's really great. And uh, I'm already looking forward to part two. Uh, and Basti, 
thank you as well for being here. I hope we can meet in person pretty soon again. Oh, yes. Um, I hope so. And yeah, well, if, if you liked it, we have more shows coming up. The next one will be uh, with Jeremy Keith and Stephanie Truth. Uh, and it's not going to be about web. It's going to be about science fiction, as this is a hobby of both of them. Um, and I'm quite interested because this is going to be show number 20. And after that one, I will do one month break as I might be able to go on holidays with my family, as it looks right Yay. now. Let's cross fingers. And then we are back in August with more shows. So keep an eye on the website, uh, Beyond Tolerant. Dot com. Um, sign up for the newsletter. You will find it on that website. Follow the social media channels and whatnot. Thank you so, so much. Have a wonderful night um, and see you soon. And now stay for some more music by Toby for the next 10, 15 minutes. Have a good night. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.